Welcome. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kitshanu b'mitzvotav v'tivanu l'asok b'divrei Torah. Amen. Thank you. And we are still um, dealing with the aftermath of the death of Aaron's sons. Uh, and that's where we are right now. So we had just started with this halacha that was just given to Aaron, that uh, Moses is not the one who receives this particular prophecy. It's Aaron alone. And this is considered to be at least some kind of compensation and reward for Aaron's maintaining silence uh, after this all happened. So he is the halacha specifically is that priests are not to get intoxicated when they minister at the altar, that that is actually uh, punishable by death. Um, and uh, we, this is mentioned as a, a um, constant and everlasting uh, law regarding, regarding the priests. So we, and not only that, so here's where we continue. And to be able to distinguish between that which is sacred and that which is profane, that is not sacred. And between that which is pure, excuse me, and between that which is impure, and that which is pure. And it's interesting that that's an issue that is going to be a major issue. And it's a category that generally speaking, I think you all know we don't really deal with in our own society, but it actually was a very major, major category. Part of its uh, significance is that when you're in an impure state, it means you cannot enter into the sacred area and of course, there are levels of impurity, there are levels of purity. However, when you're in a pure state, it opens you up to the divine presence. So this idea of purity and impurity is definitely linked to that notion of being close to the divine, to that source. So here we go on this. In other words, being able to make this distinction, to be able to clarify what is and what isn't, is an important, a very important uh, part of the process. And of course, when you're drunk, it muddles your thinking. So, and to make a distinction. So that you are able to make a distinction between service that's uh, done in pure, in sorry, in sanctity, or that which is not done in sanctity. There is, you know, profane is the only English word that I know, but in some ways, because profane has a different connotation, uh, you know, saying not, sanct not sacred is sort of the, same, the safer way to go. Ha you infer from this, she'im avad avodato, that if he in fact uh, served, in this particular capacity, that when he was uh, in a, an intoxicated state, psula, it is ineffective. It has no, it is have, has no uh, benefit. Uh, it's pasul. Uh, pasul basically is a, a word that describes something that is no, lo no longer uh, applicable or effective or something like that. This is just a reference in the Talmud, Zvachim, it uh, means sacrifices, page 17. There's a tractate, and this, of course, is Torah Kohanim. We're pretty familiar with these terms, and Torah Kohanim refers, of course, to the Sifra, to this Midrash, Halachic Midrash. Ulahorot et Bnei Israel, and to literally it means instruct the children of Israel. Eight kol hachochim, all the statutes, asher diber Hashem, which Hashem has spoken, alehem, to them, biad Moshe, through Moses, right, at the hands of Moses, literally it means. So being, so obviously, 
part of the function of the priest was to uh, give instruction to the Israelites, or to the Jewish people. So this idea, so hora is also understood as rendering halachic decisions. That's another, ver, that's the verb we use when we're talking about making a halachic decision. And the point about a halachic decision is that the question that we, should I say, should be asking ourselves is, is what we're doing, in fact, uh, something that is pleasing in the eyes of God? Is this something acceptable? That that's a, a standard uh, by which we should be living our lives, at least according to Judaism, according to the Torah, etc. So in other words, being able to know that, to be able to determine, because that's not a simple matter. Uh, and obviously there are circumstances and other kinds of issues that come up. But in a way, this whole issue of Jewish law is that attempt to act in an appropriate kind of way and to be able to instruct our lives in that particular way. So, uh, Lamad, so he, we learn, she'asur shikor b'hora'ah, that someone who is intoxicated, who's drunk, is not permitted to render halachic decisions. That's, and this is a Torah Kwanim. Yachol yehe chayav mita. Does that mean that such a person is punishable by death? Talmud, Talmud Lomar, scripture teaches, Ata uvanecha itach. So for that reason, uh, we have this phrase, you and your sons with you. And it's the with you that's the issue here. Velo tamutu. And you, you, so that you shall not die. And let, I'll just finish this up. This is in Numbers 18. I believe it's the final verse in Numbers. I did look it up. That's where I found this particular phrase. Um, the context there isn't to do necessarily with rendering de de halachic decisions. That chapter is actually about the perks it's in, in Korach, in the, in the Parsha of Korach, uh, which is the mutiny against Moses, Korach, um, Moses's cousin, who led a mutiny against him, and, uh, after, and against the whole idea of the priesthood and the privileges seen as the privileges of priesthood. And um, after the rebellion is, and the mutiny is finally taken care of appropriately, Aaron and his sons and descendants are then given these perks. That's where it happens. And it also talks about their responsibilities regarding the sacred objects and all this, 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 the, the things that are done in that context. So it goes on, Rashi goes on to say, Kohanim ba'avototam. It says priests specifically when they are ministering, I believe here, essentially at the altar. In other words, when they are in fact practicing uh, the sacri elements of the sacrificial service, that's when this is a capital offense were they to do it in, in a state of, a, of, uh, a, uh, of intoxication. But sages, when they teach, if they, if they render halachic decisions in a state of intoxication, it is not a capital offense. Is it an offense? Yes, it's an offense. They can be removed from office, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but it's not considered a capital offense. Uh, we might. It's possible that we might think that it would be, because when you render an improper halachic decision, essentially, remember, if halachic decisions have to do with acting appropriately uh, before God, then obviously, if you rendered a wrong, false halachic decision, it's the opposite. And that, that if we take these sorts of things very seriously or rigorously, then we could understand why potentially it might be, in fact, a, um, a capital offense. 
Um, and the truth is that there's another context in which such things are, are punishable by death. And this is something later on discussed in the Torah. And that is if, if an individual sage um, rebels against decisions made by like the Sanhedrin or a higher court and starts asking people or telling people to practice in ways that are not supported by that, uh, that are so that they're actually acting in a rebellious kind of way that is considered a capital offense. So, ah, yes, let's go on. Vaidaber Moshe El Haron Velazar. So now we're into Moses speaking to Aaron and to Elazar. Elazar, remember, Aaron had four sons. Nadav, Avihu, Elazar, and Itamar. So he's speaking to Aaron and to Elazar, Ve'el Itamar, and to Itamar, Banav Hanotarim, his remaining sons. Chu et Hamincha Hanoteret, take the meal offering that is that remains, Me'ishe Hashem, from the fire offerings of Hashem, the Ichluha Matzot, and you should eat it unleavened, Eitzel Hamizbeach, near the altar, Ki Kodesh Kodashim He, because it is considered most sacred. So there's again quite a lot to be implied from this particular verse. So, first of all, what's this Hanotarim? Who remained? Why does the Torah include this word? Would the sentence, if the sentence simply means that Moses was speaking to Aaron and Itamar, uh, Elazar and Itamar, his sons, why who remained? Who remained? I mean, this word could be left out. So, what is it coming to tell us? Min hamita, hamnotarim min hamita means who remained who were left over from the death that was taking place. Milamed. So this teaches, this implies, she'af alehim nikansa mita, that regarding them too, they were uh, punishable by death in the same way. Al avon ha'ego, and this came as a punishment for Aaron uh, being involved in the sin of the golden calf. Regarding the so, who okay so who shenemar, this is referenced by in Deuteronomy chapter one, uva aharon. This is where Moses is telling, speaking to the Jewish people. Remember, Deuteronomy consists of these three major speeches that Moses gives to the Jewish people prior to his departure from this world. So it says, and Aaron hit anaf Hashem maod. The Hashem, the Lord, was exceedingly angry with Aaron, the Hashmido, to destroy him. That's what it says in the Torah. The Ein Hashmada, and we understand by this kind of destruction, Ela Kiluibanim, that Hashmada refers to the um, destruction of children, losing children entirely, losing all your children. Shine Emar, as it says in Amos, this is based on simply proof texts from the Bible. In Amos chapter 2, it says, for Hashmid Piryo Mi Ma'al, and it means, and I destroyed his fruit from above. So children are considered the fruit of your body, and so this is understood. It's simply the meaning of this word lahashmid in this context. Moshe. However, Moses prayed to God not to do this. Batla machatze. It was effective halfway. It was half effective. Shinemar, as it states in Deuteronomy chapter nine, for at same chapter notice. Ve'et palel gam ba'ad aharon ba'etahi. It says, Moses again speaking to the Jewish people, telling them, and I prayed uh, also for in for the sake of Aaron at that t time. This is, you know, I I know this is very hard stuff to to hear, um, but in some ways, of course, life is at times very very tough. 
So he said to them, take the meal offering. And the reason he had to specifically tell them is what, what Rashi is trying to explain right now. Despite the fact that you are in a state of aninut. So an onen is someone, the state of a person between the death of a close relative and burial. Uh, there have been some different definitions exactly as to what, how long you're in the state of aninut, but, but, the, but the point was that an onain is someone who has suffered uh, the, the death of a very near relative and the psychological and uh, spiritual implications of, that, of being in that state. Ukadoshim asir, okay, asurim le'onay. And kodshim and sanctified food are forbidden to someone, to a, a priest who's in a state of aninut. And you may recollect that we actually discussed this particular halacha that when, when it comes to consuming sanctified food, food that's been associated with uh, sacrifices, etc., when you're in a state of aninut, you're not supposed to participate. So Moses had to tell Aaron's son, Aaron and his sons specifically that they were commanded to have to eat this particular food, et hamincha, the meal offering. Zo minchat shmini o minchat nachshon. So this was the mincha, the meal offering that was brought as part of the sacrifices that Nachshon, the head of the tribe of Judah, brought on the eighth day of the dedication of the of the sanctuary. So this the, he he was he brought offerings. We read about this um, in in Naso, I believe in Parshat Naso, of the offerings of the twelve priests. Uh, excuse me, twelve princes, and he brought his on the eighth day. And along with his offerings, there were meal offerings along with the animals that he brought. The achluha matzot and eat of it uh, unleavened. Ma Talmud Lomar, what is scripture trying to teach us? The fi shehi minchat sibur, on account of the fact that this, uh, that um, it, it, regarding a public, a public mincha, public meal offering, o minchat sha'a, and it was a specific offering that was just meal offering brought at that particular time. It means it wasn't uh, that they're public offerings that are that were brought and were commanded to be brought on regular occasions, but this particular mincha was brought at that for that particular moment. The en keyotseba lodorot, and there was no similar meal offering that would be brought uh, in future generations. And so because it was a unique mincha, hutzrach lefareshba, it was necessary for, for, it, for an explanation to be given, din sha'ar menachot, uh, the, the, uh, the laws regarding other menachot. So if he means that to say that this, because this is an exceptional mincha, uh, he needed to explain uh, how it needed to be done and whether he means here that the other, that the laws regarding other menachot also apply here. That's, that's what it seems to be saying. Uh, going on, the achaltem and you shall eat it, ota. Uh, Bamakom Kadosh in a sanctified place, Ki Chokcha, because it is your portion, Vachok Banechahi, and the portion, the allotment of your sons, Meishe Hashem, from the fire offerings of Hashem, Ki Chen Suveti, for thus I was commanded. Remember, Moses is speaking to Aaron and his sons and telling them this is what he was commanded by God to tell them. Vachok banecha, and, and a, a portion for your sons. So the fact that it says your sons here 
Ein lebanot chok bakodashim. So it says here, so to daughters, if a priest has sons, that's one thing, but it is not apportioned to the daughters in Kedoshim. Uh, there's going to be uh, an explanation as to the fact that they are permitted to eat it, but the circumstances are such that, for example, if a priest's daughter marries a non-priest, then her status becomes essentially, and I'm saying essentially because there's some small exceptions involved, but essentially she takes on the status of her husband. So part of the reason for this law uh, to exclude the daughters in the apportionment of sanctified food, they would divide it up in other words, was to prevent a non-priest essentially from eating sanctified food because the consumption of this food wasn't as so much to satisfy an appetite, but rather as an act, as an expression of divine service. And in fact, generally speaking, uh, so for example, we have a little sense of this even in the Pesach, okay, that when you eat the matzah of Pesach, the initial when you initially eat it, you need to have an appetite regarding it. But when they ate the Pesach sac sacrifice, uh, when the Israelites ate the Pesach sacrifice, they were supposed to be full. Uh, that it was then the idea was that they had already eaten and they were simply eating it now as a, as a consecrated act. So when it came to the eating the Pesach, one is supposed to eat it in the, I said the matzah, I, I know that the matzah takes the place of the Pesach these days, but uh, I also know that you're supposed to fast from Erev Pesach from approximately noon on so that you haven't, that matzah tastes special in your, in your mouth when you eat it initially at the Seder. At any rate, uh, we'll, we'll keep going on this. Ki chen tzuveti, for thus I was commanded, but aninut yochluhu specifically that even though you are in a state of aninut, you should eat it. So, in other words, that's the pur the purpose of this additional uh, uh, language here. Because uh, would we suspect that Moses was telling them to do things that he hadn't been commanded to to tell them? So it's it's making the point. In other words, that I was commanded this specifically for you to eat it, even though you're in a state of aninut. He goes on to say, and the breast of waving, the etchok hatruma. So we've got this word nufa and truma, and the the thigh of I think this is called the heave offering. To chlu, you should eat it, because he's already mentioned here about eating the mincha, so you should eat it, but makom tahor, also it needs to be in a pure, a place that is pure, or ta, ata, you, uva necha, uvnotecha itach, so it says, you, your sons, and your daughters with you. Ki chokcha, because it is your portion, the chok banecha, and the portion for your sons. So notice it doesn't say chok benotecha, but the fact is that daughters are, and I think this question, I think Harlan may have asked me this question before, but here it's clarified that women, uh, the daughters of, of, of uh, priests, and I'm sure it also means their wives, or, and this is as long as the daughters are still in their father's home, essentially, and are unmarried, they are entitled to partake and share in these particular sanctified food. We're talking here of the offerings of the shlamim sacrifices of the children of Israel. So let's take a look here if there's anything here. Okay, so Rashi says, "Ve'et chaze hatnufa," that is the breast of uh, waving, shel shal meitzibur. And he, Rashi puts us in right here that we're referring here to the shlamim offerings that are public, public shlamim offerings. Tuchlu b'machom tahor, you should eat it in a in a, a um, sorry in a pure location. 
וכי את הראשונים אכלו במקום טמא. So Rashi is saying, wait a second, is this to suggest that the first things mentioned, one is permitted to eat in an unclean place? That's not the point here. It's not to say it's supposed to be uh, pure as opposed to impure. Ela harishonim, but the early, uh, early shlamim that are mentioned, shehem kodshe kodashim, or, uh, yeah, that are indeed uh, holy of holies, hus kaku achilatam b'makom kadosh. They have to be eaten in a sanctified place. It's necessary to eat them in a sanctified place. They're obligated to eat them in a sanctified place. Aval elu ein toch But these particular, uh, this particular food, one does not have to eat it within the kilaim uh, uh, would be like the curtains of the tent of meeting, referring to the in, and when the temple was built, which didn't have curtains, uh, it had walls, but we would have been talking about the courtyard of the temple. These do not have to be eaten within the courtyard of the temple. But they need to be eaten in, in the in the middle of the camp of the Israelites, Israelite encampment, Shehu Tahor Milikanes Sham Mitzoraim, because lepers are forbidden to enter into the encampment of the Israelites. They had to remain outside that encampment and Mikan. And so that's referring to, of course, the encampment of the, of the Israelites in the wilderness. We're using language here to describe while the Israelites were in the wilderness. But what about when they entered the land of Israel, when the temple was built, etc.? Mikan. So from this, Shekodshim, Kalim, that lighter sanctified food. In other words, not sacred of sacred, not, uh, not holy of holy foods, but holy foods. I told you there are degrees of holiness. Nechalim v'chol ha'ir. They can be eaten throughout the city of Jerusalem. So Jerusalem at this point is equivalent to the Israelite encampment in the wilderness. And outside of Jerusalem, obviously is outside the camp of Israel. And so lepers would be allowed to live in that area. There's just, of course, again, a very unusual, I should say, uh, uh, and um, level of sensitivity and awareness and, uh, and, and cultural sensitivity uh, that we're not familiar with. And we're, we're being opened to this particular way of looking at things. You, your sons, and your daughters. So again, from the Sifra. So when it comes to splitting it up, in dividing it, it's you and your sons. But regarding to your daughters, remember, we already looked at the verse and analyzed it just by looking at the verse. But regarding to your daughters, they are not, they are not part of how this is portioned out. But if you want to give them uh, portions of this, they are permitted to eat the chaze ubashok in the uh, brisket and the thigh, or, uh, but, or does it say? So he's, he's going to prove this. So, or does this mean that the daughters too are supposed to receive portions from it? Talmud Lomar, and for this reason, scripture tells us, ki chokcha the chok banechad, actually uses the term chok, right? It says, it's, it is your portion and the portion of your sons, mitnu, they have been given. So in other words, chok labanim, it is portioned up according to sons, the ein chok labanot, and it is not portioned up uh, according to the daughters as well, but they are permitted to eat from it, which is not a small thing, because we know that when it comes to the truma offering, uh, non-kohanim non are not allowed to have it at all. 
and I'm going to put in the place here, right here. And I don't know if I'm going to stop the share. And I don't know if any of you would like to comment on this. I know there's a lot to think about. Um, I've shared a lot of information with you. So any clarifications or questions or comments at this point before I turn off the recording. All right, stunned silence, I interpret this as. Okay, I'm gonna stop the recording, thanks.